are now at minus 1.4 kilometers in Beatrix gold mine. This is the closest you actually can compare with what might be happening on Mars. We try to find out how do organisms survive down here. That will give us an answer and some clues where to look for on other planets. I follow the worm to some extent. Wherever the worm goes, I will go. I've been to the mines how many times, I don't know it by heart. I stopped counting at 50. We are focusing on mines because they are the deepest in the world. There's no place on the planet where you can go deeper underneath the surface than in South Africa. I am Gaetan Borghani. I am a zoologist by training, and I'm studying nematodes, also called roundworms in the deep subsurface. Evolutionary, it is one of the oldest multicellular organisms still known to man to this date. I had been looking for the worm since 2006, so it took two years to actually find it. You can't see them by the naked eye. And they are everywhere. I would not call the devil worm invincible, but it's a very tough animal. I am fascinated by the planet Mars. Mars is pretty inhospitable as it is today, so on the surface, finding life will be highly improbable. If life exists on the planet, it will be deep underneath the surface. And we are finding that there is actually much, much more than we ever thought possible. So that gives us great hopes that if you dig on Mars, you might actually still find pockets of life that maybe one day were on the surface, but are now only surviving deep underground. The deepest one we found was at minus 3.6 kilometers, and that is still the deepest found nematode on the planet. It makes no sense looking in nice places because we already know a lot about them. It's just by looking at the edge of what is still possible that that will learn us how likely it is to find life somewhere else under extreme conditions. What is most remarkable about nematodes is their survival capability. I mean, I once found a worm in a cave in Mexico, which was able to survive at pH zero. Imagine this. We need 21% oxygen as humans to survive indefinitely. A worm can survive indefinitely on half a percentage of oxygen. I mean, if you can survive pH zero and you can survive three kilometers underground and you can survive a space shuttle Columbia breaking up and then the experiment with worms falling to the earth and still survive and recover. I've not seen another organism do a thing like that. The first time we found the nematode is actually we came back from Beatrix mine in South Africa. And I opened the filter and there attached to the filter still with its tail was this single worm wriggling about. So I was like, completely going through the roof. I had finally found what I was looking for. The unfortunate problem was its tail was broken, and normally that is pretty deadly for a nematode. So the next few days was like talking to the worm in intensive care, saying, please, please reproduce, produce an egg so that I get new worms. And it ended up producing 12 more eggs, but that was a day I still vividly remember to this day. In a certain sense, they are my babies. A worm has a digestive system like we have, it has a nervous system like we have. It eats the bacteria it finds around them. It produces its own sperm and its own eggs in the same animal, so it does self-fertilization. The one we were looking at we, was a new species. The press called it the devil worm. So this morning it's 4.40. Um, it's early. That's the part I hate about the sampling, getting up early. We're going to the place where we originally found the devil worm. We 
are now going about a mile underground, where it will be approximately 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The scientific process is very difficult and a long one. Most of the time you think about something, you have a working hypothesis, and you end up somewhere else where you did not expect to be. This is the rock face. There is water running between cracks in these rocks. Geologists drilled in the mine this borehole, which they put a valve on because so much water is coming out of it. So we attached a sampling equipment that runs directly from the borehole over this filter. That will stop any multicellular organism. The water then runs through here over this little wheel. Now this little wheel is actually intended to slow down the water so that you get a heap up of water here so that we do not have a reverse contamination. And I'm not so much interested in rediscovering what I already discovered before. I want to find new worms, new animals, new things. Not the same. I do not want to repeat what I already did. From the point of view of biology, the, the importance of the discovery is that nobody believed, even remotely possible, that a multicellular organism could survive those extreme conditions so far under the surface of the Earth. Professor at Princeton University compared it to finding Moby Dick in the Great Lakes or finding the monster of Loch Ness. And then you actually find it, so which means that your theoretical prediction become real. From the point of view of scientific curiosity, it doesn't get any better than this. Temperature is 23 degrees, pH is 7.3. This is real worm country. So all around you, there is water flowing through these rocks. And some will contain worms, some will contain bacteria, some will contain both. And that is quite amazing, actually. But wouldn't it be lovely to be doing this on Mars instead of Earth? That would be quite nice. When I get up early in the morning to go to the mine, I very often ask myself, what the hell am I doing in the morning? But once I'm here, I'm actually quite happy to be here. What has changed in the scientific community is there was a time when fundamental science was looked upon by the population and by our leaders as something positive. I mean, don't forget the last 2,000 years was fundamental science, people asking very basic questions. But the times have changed to the idea that you can buy innovation. If you give a lot of money to a small group of people in a room and say these are society's problems, solve them, it doesn't work that way. Most discoveries are done by accident, so how could I possibly ever explain to anyone what the return on my investment will be? When I started this research, there were a lot of people who had serious doubts as to the validity of the assumption and whether it should be done. But in the end, I think if you're really convinced about your idea and you think you have the data, you should just go for it. I mean, it would not be the first time that someone opposes an idea who turns out to be right. My work does not help to answer the questions, are we alone, are we not alone, is there life on Mars or not? It might just indicate that life always finds a way. And therefore, if you have a planetary body of where you think, eh, it's not going to work here, or this won't have happened, you should be very careful before you say no. Because you do not know what you're going to find. I never expected to find a zoo with so many invertebrates, but I did. One of the big questions I have is the question whether these specimens actually resurface in a hot spring on the surface. If all life on the surface is destroyed, nothing is left on the surface, let's call that mass sterilization. If those animals resurface again, there might maybe be spots on Mars where water in some form or another actually reappears again. Life could kickstart again. I know it seems far-fetched, but it should be considered. There are questions I would like to see answered before I pass away. Is there life on Mars? Because that is a question that has consumed me to some extent almost all my professional life. And I think the answer is yes. If they give me an opportunity and say, look, we give you a reasonable chance to arrive alive on Mars, I'm gone, even if there is no return ticket. This is the best thing you can possibly imagine as a biologist. I would like to witness the moment of first contact. That is also something 
which is going to be huge.